What's up Speedy's Garage Gang? I've gotten a ton of questions about the floor coating we use in the shop, so stay tuned and we'll show you what we used. No, I'm not gonna do that to you guys. I know you've been waiting to see what happened to Go Mango's engine. I had a little fun with this um, on the Hellcat forum. I let everybody vote on which video they wanted to see next, and I gave two options. One was what engine we went with as a replacement, or two, what actually happened to the original engine. The votes were very, very close, but in the end, what happened to the original engine won out. So today, I'm gonna tear the engine apart and show you what we actually found. And I like to make my videos as interesting as they can be, but also show some knowledge, I guess is the way I'll put it. I won't, I won't say I'll teach people, but I wanna show some knowledge, some things that I've learned and some things that I've come across. This video is gonna be quite a bit more technical than normal, and I'll do my best to make it interesting, but because of the technicality of the video, that's gonna be a little bit difficult. And this video was shot over several days, and as I took the engine apart, there's a lot of speculation that I was making in the video. So if this was before I really had a chance to, to really show Mike pictures of what had happened and send him some video of what we saw inside the engine. This is before I had a chance to talk to other people that I consider experts in the field. So kind of take that with a grain of salt as we're getting into it. At the end, I'll, I'll talk through, at the end of this video, I'll talk through now that I've had some time to really ask people and think things over, and, and several people on the forums actually gave some very, very good theories, but in the end, this will all be just theory on what happened. It'll be educated theory, you know, looking at it, analyzing the parts. I'm gonna show you guys the piston as well as some good pistons out of a Hellcat so you can kind of compare what they look like. So this will kind of be a, an exploratory video where we take the engine apart, look at what happened. I was shocked to be honest, and so was most other people that I talked to that we had this kind of failure because normally we're not seeing this until the, the cars get up to around a thousand horsepower a little bit over and really pushing some limits. Mine was around 800. We were um, doing just some shakedown testing on 93 octane, so nothing too crazy, and we had this failure. So looking at the tune and the data logs and all of that stuff, it was pretty mild. So again, we did some speculation in the next few clips that you're gonna see, stick around to the end, and I'll tell you what I really think happened. And a special thanks to all you guys that sent me the encouraging emails, and even some of you that offered to help pay for the repairs to Go Man Go. I don't really roll like that. The way you can help me is just continue to come back and watch the content. I really enjoy making the videos because it gives me a little bit of uh, time to do something creative, which I enjoy doing, and also helps spread the word about the channel. I didn't start taking it seriously until we hit about 10,000 subscribers. We're up to 15,000 now, but the channel's been around a while and I just kind of let it languish for lack of a better term. I didn't really take it serious. I didn't realize what it could become. So help me spread the word. That's how you can help me out. Okay, so we're gonna start with me going over to Mr. Mopar's shop and taking a look at the torn down engine for the very first time. Well, that ain't good. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Speedy's Garage. We're over at Master Tech's shop giving a look at Go Man Go. It's only been a few hours. They've already got the engine out and we actually know what happened to it. So here's the original engine out of Go Man Go. The pistons all look fine till we got to number seven. The top actually looks fine. So it doesn't appear to have been any issues with the fuel or the timing or the boost. However, when you look at the back side, it broke a rod. So for some reason, cylinder seven decided to let go. You can look down in there. You can see everything is still attached. It even spins pretty freely actually. So the bearings are still good and everything. So very odd to have that happen. I've only heard of a couple of Hellcat engines having rods fail, and usually they're at the 1,000 horsepower level. But this one definitely had a problem. And you can see on the edges where it was rocking back and forth in the cylinder. So now we know what our issue was in the data log that was causing that timing to be pulled. It was something in the motor vibrating. See it on both sides. Kind of strange. So... At least we know what happened. It wasn't the tune, it wasn't the fuel. And there's a spark plug, as you can see, ground straps are still intact. No issues there, other than they're covered with oil, obviously. But no problems with the spark plugs either. So the rod just let go. Very strange. Oh, 
There's one melted. Yeah, we got one melted off right there. It was cylinder two. Putting it back the way we're going to put it. <laughs> Not putting it back the way we're going to put it back. <laughs> that one's cooked. Whoops. Golly. Your thing came out. Soon, here's the plugs from the passenger side. So this is eight, six, four. Everything looks normal. Then you get the cylinder two. We've got burnt spark plugs. And eight actually has broken porcelain on one of the plugs, the rearmost plug. And then I think, yeah, it was a eight, six, four did two. The porcelain broke on that one. Okay, so we're gonna pull the head off. Showed you before, found some burnt up spark plugs. So this is on the passenger side. So two, four, six, and eight. Uh, cylinder two was the worst of the bunch. So we're gonna pull the head off and take a look at that. So here's our rockers. If you haven't seen the inside of one of these before, you have an intake and an exhaust. Push rods here, see those. Now we're gonna take the rockers off and then get to the head bolts. If you're doing this and you care, the rocker arm bolts are 10 millimeter, the top head bolts are 10 millimeter, and the inside head bolts are 15 millimeter. And I usually take them on and off in the reverse order I would put them on. Um, the rocker arms are outside in, and the heads will be inside out. Doesn't matter as much on this engine because it's going to have to be rebuilt anyway, but if you were doing this on an engine that was good, you'd want to pay attention to that. So here's what we can see. You get down to cylinder two, you can see here where the spark plug, the ones that we showed you that were burnt, so you remember that? Well, you got ground strap had to go somewhere, little pieces of it, they're welded to the top of the piston. So hopefully you can kind of see that. That is not, you can't wipe it off. It's actually welded to the top of the piston there. That's cylinder two. I expected to find that maybe in cylinder eight, but cylinder two was beat up pretty good by that burnt up spark plug. Actually, I took a look at the back side of the head, and you can see there that the pieces of the piston actually came off or were beat, or a piece of the spark plug were came off, or came off and actually beat into the piston. So I thought they got hot and welded in there, but actually not enough room between the piston and the top of the head there, and so it just got smashed into the piston. Okay, I'm gonna show you a close-up of the piston in question. This was cylinder seven. You can see the top looks pretty normal. No big deal, it would sit in the engine just like this. You'll notice the arrow tells you that's pointing towards the front of the motor. If there had been detonation, problems with boost, fuel, timing, tune, anything like that, you would see some little spots look like they had been welded on the top of the piston. And this one, when we actually opened up the engine, this was sitting at the very top of the cylinder. So we pulled the head off, Looking at the pistons, we couldn't really tell what had even happened until Mr. Mopar noticed that one of them looked like it was a little bit out of sync and where it should have been in relation to depth in the cylinder. He said it should have been a little bit further down, but it was sitting right at the top just like this. We used a shop back, sucked it out, boop. There's what we found on the back side. Now here's the crazy thing. Look at what a clean break that is. You know how marble breaks, like, like the rock marble or granite, and it has that crystalline looking look to it? That's exactly what that looks like. 
And look what it's right around. It's right around, I, I believe those are like oil control holes that, that let some of the pressure out. It looks like it broke. And this side did the same thing. I'm trying to get this a good shot so you can see this. It looks like it broke right around these oil control spots because that one's broken too. Same exact place. So the top of the piston again looks perfect. You'll see it actually had turned in the cylinder I guess as it was vibrating and the, you know, the motor was shutting down when it was braking it had spun a little bit and so a valve kissed it right there but normally you would have had the relief and it barely touched it. I mean it barely made a mark but you would, the valves weren't bent or anything you would have had the relief right here so it had turned like that in the cylinder when we took it out. So the intake valve had touched it a little bit but again here's the back and it just it, it's like it just completely came apart. And here is what a normal Hellcat piston should look like. These came out of an engine that got rebuilt with a 426 or something. You can see how the wrist pin area looks. Flip that over for you. I expected them to be more beefy to be honest. The wrist pin's pretty good. Thick wall, beefy. But I expected the Ringland or the oil, um, the distance between the top of the piston and the Ringland to be a little bit thicker. Now don't pay attention to any of this stuff. These were banged around in a shop somewhere. They were going to toss them out. And I called around and found a shop and said, hey, can you send me some Hellcat pistons from a rebuild or something? So these just got thrown in, literally thrown in this box and they banged around on each other getting over here. But they'll, they'll prove the point. I mean, they'll make the point. I, I want to be able to show what a... Um, normal piston would look like in rod so this is the normal rod and piston obviously this thing goes on the crank and they are pinned or um, shouldn't say pinned they have lock rings in here that lock them down there are lock rings in there rod doesn't look like anything too special the, the small end that goes on the wrist pin is, is reasonably reasonably good size normal bolts so this is on a pre 2018 Hellcat the 2018 and ups got ARP bolts in here for the rod bolts so that was an upgrade I don't know why Dodge made that but they must have seen something happening that made them think they needed to upgrade that there's what the top of the piston looks like normal so I wanted to give, give this to you guys as an example to show you the difference and so it just basically ripped off the entire bottom half of the piston in cylinder seven in my car and the other crazy thing I'll show you is again the piston would have been sitting like this in the car if you look at this edge I hope you can see that on film it was rocking in the cylinder it actually wore that edge down quite a bit hopefully you can see that see how shiny it is it's flattened off and the same thing on this side so I think what was happening is the piston was starting to fail it was coming apart and you can kind of see some marking in here where the rod was starting to move around and hit the inside of the piston there and I think that's what happened to it and I actually happen to have one of the factory stock pistons from old orange crush so this is a 5.7 RT Challenger stock piston and rod and you can see the big difference well, obviously the size is bigger because this is a 6.2 and this is a 5.7, but you can see how much thicker the wrist pin is, number one. Number two, these have the little C-clips on them that lock them in place. This was press fit, so there is no clip. It just press fits in there. But when I made the comment about the oil rings and the, the ring land thickness, you can see the Hellcat's a little bit more but it's not as much as I would have expected. The upgraded pistons I put in Orange Crush were twice as thick as that, and they were probably 33% thicker than this, so I don't know. I expected the Hellcat parts to be a little bit more beefy, but maybe I just got unlucky. I'm gonna to try to work with Mike from the Hellcat forum. He says he has a way to test these Hellcat pistons to failure. So I was able to get the shop to send me three of them. I'm gonna keep one for show and tell, and then ship two of them out to Mike and see what he can come up with on those failures. So be sure to stay tuned for that. So now let's take a look at some of the data logs that I was running. You guys know anytime I make a pass at the track, I run a data log just so I have it. And this is exactly why, because I can go back, 
I can take a look at all kinds of stuff. If I have a really good run, I can see what RPM I launched at. If something goes wrong, I can take a look at that and try to find out why. So here's a shot of a data log that was run two weeks before I had the engine failure. It was on the same exact fuel. It was Shell 93, and it was even from the same gas station, same everything. And you can see everything looks pretty normal. Right when it shifts into fifth, you see just a sprinkle of short-term knock retard down there. It got one degree. And that's usually something you wouldn't be too worried about. You take a look at that, you see something like that, and you say, hey, I'm gonna go take a half a degree of timing out of the tune right in that one spot. But one degree of timing is absolutely nothing, or one degree of short-term knock retard, I'm sorry, is absolutely nothing to be too concerned about. You see the air fuel ratio looks good. It's a pretty mild setup. So everything looks very, very normal here. I saw no reason to think there was a problem. Now here's a screenshot of the data log the day we started having trouble. So it made three passes at the track that day. It ran a 10.03, a 10.04, and a 10.05. And basically this is uh, two weeks after the previous data log that I just showed you. So 10.03, it ran a 10.02 uh, on that data log that I showed you previously. And now, right now we're back at the track. It's two weeks later, it ran a 10.03, 10.04, 10.05. The only thing we had changed is we, we got rid of the old worn out Hoosier slicks that probably had a hundred and something passes on them and we had Mickey Thompson ET Street R's on the car, and they are a 305, 45, 17, I believe is the size. And we were cutting some good 60 foots, 1003, 1004, 1005, but we were seeing this weird spike. That spike right there was pulling every bit of timing out of the car plus some. So the car had 11 degrees of timing in it total, and that, that's as you creep up. So as, you, as the RPMs increase, more and more timing goes in. 11 degrees total, you can see here the car was pulling 14 degrees. Now the crazy thing is, I took a look at the knock sensor volts because when you see that, it's showing up as short-term knock retard in the log, I should see corresponding knock sensor voltage telling me I'm getting knock. However, looking at the knock sensor volts, they're basically quiet. So it's like, what in the world is going on? And it did that on all three passes. And so I basically gave up trying to run nines that day, figured I'm gonna have to get home and figure out what's going on, get the car back to the shop but I needed a data point to make sure it wasn't the tune. So I loaded a previous tune we had in the car when we had it on the dyno. The only difference was it had one degree less timing. So instead of 11 degrees, it had 10 degrees. And I mainly just wanted to reload a, another tune in the car to make sure it wasn't some anomaly with the tune load or who knows, right? So I put the 10 degree timing tune in the car. I go back to make the last pass. I'm data logging. First gear, take off, second gear, boom. Here's the data log from that pass. Now what you can see here, the crazy thing is, you see the engine fail basically. Watch the IAT spike. The intake air temperature or air charge temperature goes through the roof in three seconds. It went from 130 degrees, which is pretty normal, to 248 degrees. And that's important for what we find later in the motor, when we, or what we found in the motor. When we took the spark plugs out, started looking at everything, I found cylinder two had melted the spark plug. Well, if it wasn't tuned fuel or boost, what would have caused that to happen? Once an engine fails and you lose all oil pressure, all bets are off. All kinds of catastrophic things are happening inside that motor. And I was talking to a mechanic buddy of mine and he said, you realize cylinder two is the companion to cylinder seven that broke. So we lost cylinder seven, cylinder two is its companion. There was probably an inferno going on in that motor at that time. My suspicion is there was a fire inside of that engine the IAT or air charge temperature to go from 132 to 248 in three seconds, it just scorched that second uh, cylinder uh, spark plug, just burned the strap off and everything. I wasn't getting any misfire, check engine lights, no codes, no funny running, no nothing before the failure. And if the spark plugs had been having any trouble, we would have seen some check engine lights and, and shown a problem with the spark plug ahead of that engine failure. So that's why data logging is important. We can come back and do some little, you know, kind of Sherlock Holmesing, for lack of a better term, and look through those data logs and, and look, and we found that that IAT went through the roof. 248 degrees is insane. Okay, so now to the theory of what do we think happened. Honestly, I had no idea. I had several conversations with Mike. I actually, he asked me to bring the broken piston with me to Challenger Fest so he could look at it. And he was shaking his head and he said, man, I'll be honest with you, I have not seen anything like that in one of these. Um, we speculated that it might have been when I had the RPM set to 6,700 RPM. And this was 
five months or six months prior to the engine failure, I made four passes at the track and I raised the RPM limits in the tune a little bit to see if I would get better ET. And I raised them to 6,700 on all the gears. But what was happening is in first and second, they go through the gears so fast, by the time it hit the RPM limit I had commanded in the transmission tune, it told the computer to make the shift. By the time the shift occurred, it had shot past that 6,700 RPM limit by about 300 RPMs and I was seeing 6,900 to 7,000. I didn't realize that was happening until I got home and really looked closely at the logs. Usually when I'm at the track, I'm looking for short-term knock retard, making sure the air fuel's correct and major things like that. I assumed since I put 6,700 RPM in the transmission, it was shifting at 6,700, but it wasn't. First and second shot the 6,900 or 7,000. Mike says that he runs his shot car to 7,200 and he hasn't seen any problems and runs it to 7,200 all the time. He says he's actually run it to 7,500 before just to see if he would pick up any ET and he didn't. So he backed it back down to 72. He's got loads of customers. He's tuned hundreds of Hellcats, loads of customers running them to 6,600, 6,800, 6,900. A lot of other tuners are doing the same thing. A recent thing that I've heard about is a lot of tuners are setting the tune in first and second to 6,900 because there's less load on the motor and it gets the 60 foot down, gives you some really good ETs at the track. So I wasn't doing anything to mine that was way out of the ordinary. However, talking to Kurt from Dusterhoff Tuning, who really knows his stuff, he said he's seen a couple of these have this problem when the RPMs were pushed really high. He tells the customer, hey, if you want to go past 6450, 6500, you're taking a risk. The customer says, I don't care, I want to go fast. He bumps the RPMs up. A couple of them have failed. Same way, it rips the wrist pin out of the back of the piston, looks like it just tears the piston apart. So his theory is that some of these pistons just aren't as strong as others. Remember, they're mass produced parts. They're not custom built engines, they're mass produced engines. They're strong, but you're still talking about mass produced parts, you know, things that aren't top top, like a custom built race motor. So I think some of the pistons maybe aren't as strong as others and maybe I got one of those, those couple of 69, 7,000 RPM shifts weakened that piston over the next four or five months. It just got worse and worse and worse until it finally failed at the track. So that's my theory on it. There's a gentleman named Mike on the Hellcat forum who used to race two stroke dirt bikes. And he said he had seen this type of failure occur in those two strokes when he didn't get the mixture exactly right. The piston would overheat and seize in the top of the cylinder. And when it expanded from heat and the cylinder wasn't perfectly round, it would rip the wrist pin out. The Hellcat engines I'm told are not torque plate honed. So you could have had a situation in my car, I don't know, where the cylinder wasn't perfectly round in cylinder seven, that piston just heated up just enough to stick, because we did find it right at the top of the cylinder, and it stuck right at the top of that cylinder, and when it went to pull it back down, it ripped the wrist pin out. Then when the engine cooled off, everything went back to normal size, we were able to pull it out with a shot back. It's a four stroke engine, not a two stroke engine, so they get that extra exhaust stroke to cool off, so I don't know that that's really what happened. My gut just says we got a bad piston, but it was a very good theory. A lot of chatter and a lot of discussion about this over on the Hellcat forum. We've been having a good time with it. I'll let the guys vote on which video was next, guys and gals, I guess I should say. And so it's been a, a really good discussion. That's where I put this kind of content out. I like to learn and help other people learn. And it's a kind of a community thing for me. And I wish we could see more people that have these types of issues talk about them. But a lot of times when something breaks, nobody wants to talk about it. They just want to move on and kind of sweep it under the rug. They're afraid their tuner will get blamed or they'll get blamed for not knowing how to drive the car, or not data logging it properly or who knows some kind of thing like that me i just want to get the information out there so everybody can learn from it finally i'm going to say that since i put this series out ever since i showed that we actually had some kind of failure with the engine i probably had five or six emails from people who saw that video and they said hey man mine did the same exact thing not all of them were cylinder seven some were cylinder five i heard some were cylinder two some were bone stock so i heard from a dealer that they actually had a press car in their shop. They actually reached out to me and they, they were curious what had happened to mine. And I told them it was cylinder seven that failed. And I said, it looked like the wrist pin just ripped right out of the back of the piston. We found the piston sitting on the top of the cylinder. And the guy told me that they had one of Dodge's press cars in their shop. It was stock, no pulleys, no nothing. Exact same problem, exact same cylinder. So I'm not trying to scare everybody into thinking there's a problem with the Hellcat engine. I think there's enough of them out there that are making 900 or 1,000 horsepower and running really, really well. We're not seeing them fail that often. But I think we are starting to see a small trend that there can be a little bit of a lottery on some of the pistons that get put in these cars. And we may see some fail at times just because they're not good as good as others. So that's really what I think happened to the car. I think we just had a defective piston. We've gone on and moved on. Next week, you're gonna see 
what we upgraded to, and I doubt we're gonna have any issues with that motor. So keep our fingers crossed. We're gonna get back to the track and try to run those nines. Okay guys, so that's gonna be it for today and apologies for the video being a little bit long, but there was a whole lot to go through today. Leave me some comments below and let me know what you thought about what you saw on the, on the piston failure, the stock Hellcat pistons, how it compared to the 5.7 piston. Leave me some comments. I'm out here to learn. I'm curious what you guys think. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you liked it and I hope you did. Be sure to check us out on Instagram. It's at speedies underscore garage as well as our website, www.speediesgarage.net. Be sure to subscribe and check in next week because I'm gonna talk about the engine we went with and Go Mango as an upgrade.